Hello, my name is Dr. Allison Hodacek, and I'm a third year resident in the University of Wisconsin Family Medicine Residency Program in Madison, Wisconsin. Today we are going to be discussing sepsis and septic shock. Sepsis and septic shock are two very commonly encountered problems in hospital medicine. The purpose of this podcast is to review the definitions of these diseases and the underlying pathophysiology. In the associated podcasts, we will review a clinical approach to sepsis and septic shock management protocols. So why is this topic important? Sepsis is a 10th leading cause of death in the U.S. Between 1999 and 2005, about 6% of deaths in America were related to sepsis. Additionally, the economic burden of the disease is tremendous. It is estimated that about 16.7 billion healthcare dollars are spent annually on sepsis-related care. It is important that family physicians are trained to recognize sepsis and to initiate the initial steps in treatment. If you are planning on working in an ER or hospital, you will definitely encounter this and will have to manage it. Even for physicians who are planning outpatient-only practices, it is critical to be able to recognize sepsis because these patients will sometimes present in the clinic. So what is sepsis? Broadly speaking, it is the body's systemic inflammatory response to an infection. The key behind sepsis, however, is that it is a dysfunctional immune response. We'll get back to this in a minute, but first, there are a couple definitions that everyone should be familiar with. The first is Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, or SIRS. SIRS is a body-wide inflammatory state. It can be thought of as a very vigorous systemic immune response. The key about SIRS is that it may be triggered by any sort of event that causes the immune system to become very activated. So infection is one possible trigger for SIRS, but other causes may include trauma, burns, anaphylaxis, pancreatitis, surgery, and venous thromboembolism. To meet criteria for SIRS, the patient must have two or more of the following. Fever or hypothermia, as indicated by temperature either greater than 38 degrees or less than 36 degrees. Tachycardia, with a heart rate greater than 90 beats per minute. Tachypnea, as evidenced by respiratory rate greater than 20 or a PaCO2 less than 32. And either leukocytosis with a white blood cell count greater than 12,000 or leukopenia with a white blood cell count less than 4,000. So remember we said that sepsis is broadly defined as the body's systemic inflammatory response to infection. So technically speaking, to be defined as having sepsis, a patient must have a suspected infection and also meet criteria for SIRS. This is a more objective definition. To take things one step further, one may define sepsis as being severe sepsis if the condition is associated with hypotension or if there's evidence of organ dysfunction or hypoperfusion. Septic shock is defined as sepsis with hypotension that is refractory to IV fluid resuscitation. The reason that clarifying these definitions is important is that it allows us to more clearly communicate a patient's extent of illness to the healthcare team. For example, some patients may become septic but never truly develop hypotension or end organ dysfunction. Their treatment course and prognosis is going to be much different than a patient who becomes septic and then proceeds to develop hypotension, respiratory failure, and renal failure. So being able to accurately use these definitions is important when you are communicating with others. So the big question is, why does this happen? What's the pathophysiology behind this? When there is infection or an insult upon our bodies, our immune systems normally react and cause an inflammatory response. This is normally a good thing and it promotes healing and resolution of the insult. In septic shock, however, the inflammatory response becomes explosive and uncontrolled. Sepsis has been called malignant intravascular inflammation. The term malignant because it is uncontrolled, unregulated, and self-perpetuating. 
In the usual immune response, there is release of both pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory mediators. These balance each other to promote tissue healing. In severe sepsis, however, this response becomes uncontrolled and the balance is lost. This instead results in tissue injury. The term intravascular is used because unlike the usual immune response, which is localized to the site of the insult, in sepsis you get systemic immune response in which inflammatory mediators are transmitted throughout the bloodstream and can affect numerous different parts of the body. The numerous pro-inflammatory markers that are released include several different cytokines. It is beyond the scope of this podcast to discuss the roles of the individual mediators. The net effect of these mediators, broadly speaking, is systemic vasodilation, vascular endothelial injury, and coagulopathy. The combination of those three things results in hypotension and reduced tissue perfusion. If tissues aren't being perfused with blood, this causes ischemic tissue injury. Additionally, it is thought that the inflammatory mediators may also have direct cytotoxic effects on the tissues, thereby worsening tissue injury. So backing up to the big picture, how does severe sepsis present clinically? How do you know if someone has end organ dysfunction and hypoperfusion? There is definitely a wide range of presentations and every patient will be somewhat unique in terms of which signs they present with. Hypotension is very commonly seen. Tissue injury on the level of the lungs may present as pulmonary edema or outright respiratory failure. Patients often present with acute kidney injury or renal failure. Liver failure, which is sometimes called shock liver in this setting, may also occur. Many of these patients with sepsis will have altered mental status or encephalopathy. Some may also develop peripheral neuropathy from injury to the peripheral nervous system. In summary, sepsis is very common and it is imperative that family physicians recognize the disorder. Sepsis is driven by a dysfunctional systemic inflammatory response to infection. In severe sepsis and septic shock, there is end organ hypoperfusion and tissue injury. In the next podcast, we will move on to discussing the initial workup of sepsis and septic shock.